going on, boys and queens? Text your girlfriends, I am your girlfriends, and let them know we are live back on another installment of the Jess Kelly Show. I'm sitting down with the pioneer icon, Tracy Africa Norman. Um, we're going to be uh, experiencing uh, Tracy's whole life and everything she went through when uh, abruptly she was uh, taken off the cover of the Claro box. So I'm definitely here with Tracy and I'd like to welcome Tracy to the show. Thank you. Hi Tracy, what's going on? Uh, I'm here today to represent the community. I you just... invited me for this interview and I promised you I would be here. I am just so excited, like y'all, like everybody, I was talking to Tracy while we was on our way over here, and I'm like, I sit down and I interview with my sisters, and I tell their stories, their movie, however we want to put it, but I'm just like, I'm really nervous right now to be sitting down interviewing with Tracy, like I have seen videos of Tracy and everything, but I'm really nervous, but back um, 30 years ago, Tracy was the first transgender model on the cover of the Claro box. How did it feel? Um, well, it felt fantastic, but you need to understand that in my DNA and my brain process never didn't have the process of thinking I was transgender. I always thought that I was a woman, behaved and acted such. Okay. So the word transgender back in the 70s didn't exist. We were called more negative names. So like what like before we so before we even get into the Claro and everything, um, give us a, a background story about where you came from and how did you grow up and things of that nature. I was born in North New Jersey. I was raised by a single parent mother, and she raised two kids through the fifties. I experienced the um, the North riots. I was a teenager and. Here I am. And here she is. I was on the, when I graduated high school, so I started my transact transition late. So after graduation day, I always tell the same story because it was the day that I um, found out what true love was all about <laughs> and unconditional love. Because you know you hear these stories about unconditional love, but you, as a teenager, you know it doesn't register. So um, literally, after the ceremony, uh, my mother and I went out in front of my school. We sat down on my school steps. I handed her my diploma, and I proceeded to tell her my truth and how I wish to uh, navigate my life through this world as a woman. And what she did was just open her arms, gave me a big hug, told me she loved me, and she will always support me. Okay, so how did it feel when you started the whole transition process? Uh, it felt very natural for me. I um, had started on birth controls. So uh, someone that I met in junior high, who left junior high, um, uh, gave me some birth controls, but I didn't take them until after high school. So I kept them all of that time. And she told me to take all the white ones, but not the blue ones at the bottom. Okay. So at that time, I guess, you know, because there was different color codes. So I had white on the top for like two or yeah. three weeks and then the blue ones at the bottom. Yeah. So she said, don't take the blue. So I started taking them. I started developing my breasts. Um, when I graduated high school, I don't like the term fat, so I used the term thick. Okay. And so, but during the course of uh, a couple of summers, I started losing weight naturally, not being conscious of it, and ta-da, this was underneath. <laughs> and all of this was underneath, all of this beauty and everything. So, um, so you said you was from Newark, New Jersey. So, um, did they have the scene in uh, Newark, New Jersey, like the uh, the ballroom scene? Like, how did you get involved? Like, like you know, the different scenes and becoming. You went from becoming Tracy Africa. Well, um, in New Jersey, I don't remember them having uh, a ball community or ball scene. What they had was female impersonists, and they would do these big shows. And the uh, biggest show was the Bobby White Review. And um, Bobby and uh, his roommate would always put on these elaborate um, 
female, female impersonating shows. So that was my interpretation of um, transgender. Okay. Oh, uh, so how? <clears throat> So, because I really don't want to talk about the boardroom or all that stuff. I, no shade to anybody that's out there, but it's but I just it's want a part, it's, it's a part, part it's a part of, of it. It's a part of the life. But I want to get into um, you know how did Tracy uh, start the modeling aspect of her life and uh, stuff like that. But the boardroom is definitely a part of Tracy and what uh, made Tracy. But you know I don't want to stick on boardroom. We tell that we do that all the time. But uh, so how did you get into um, modeling? stuff of that nature. Okay. So a couple of summers, friends that I had made before my transition, like friends that I made in uh, junior high, after graduation I kind of disappeared from them because I was uh, doing what I was doing. And one day uh, I was walking downtown Newark and I passed by this store and two friends of mine from the past came running out, uh, Tommy Garrett and Yvonne Garrett. And they heard about me, my transition, and <clears throat> they knew my name. So they called me and they said, Tracy, and I turned around and saw them and got invited into the store and they started talking. So Tommy was already a Ford model who was working a lot. And he encouraged me to start modeling because he thought that I was pretty enough to be a model. So I started um, rehearsing, being in front of the camera, taking pictures, trying to learn my body, what to do, what not to do. <laughs> I made a lot of mistakes. <laughs> With everybody. And it's about learning your uh, poses and learning the different angles and stuff. So. Exactly. So um, then I started, they started training me how to walk. And then I met, um, after my first fashion show, local fashion show in Newark, I met um, a makeup artist by the name of Al Grundy, and his brother was Daryl Grundy, and they were, the, he was a designer, Daryl, and I became their muse. So we, I would go over to their house, and Al would paint me, Daryl would dress me, we'd go out in his hallway of his home, and I would learn how to walk and present clothing. And then Al worked for Audrey Smalls, who works in New York City, and uh, she's she has a company that she dresses um, models backstage for every major fashion show on Seventh Avenue, and so through that, Al would call me and tell me who was doing a show, like if Boston was doing a show, where it was, what time, and where to be, and what time to be there. So I started going to these professional shows to see how the professional girls walk, and what I learned immediately was the girls always put one foot in front of the other. <laughs> so that's when I came home and started practicing because I was walking down the runway as Annie Oakley because I had these bow legs and I needed to control them and that helped me control uh, my legs and so I started from the bottom up how to uh, walk and how to present myself. So you used to walk at our fashion shows? Local fashion shows local, in New York. Local fashion shows, so yes. you never got to the main stage of walking? No, I never got to any of the um, shows in New York. What I did was come up on an interview, which I thought I was attending a fashion show. So I come out of the subway, and I'm walking alongside of um, uh, Park Avenue South, uh, against the park and I noticed across the street at the Pierre Hotel there was a group of girls on the corner and these women I recognized because they were models that I've seen in magazines before. So I noticed that a group separated and went down the street and then another group went into the hotel. So I followed the group into the hotel. Now they went past the ballroom and for some reason, my mind told me to stay with them. So everybody loaded up on the elevators. We got on the elevator. I believe it was the sixth floor. Don't quote me. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so when we got off of the elevator, I was the first one off. So I went to the left. All the girls went to the right. So I turned around, followed them, and I was the last one on line. So every girl was going into this big, giant, beautiful suite. And the line was so long that some of us had to stay out in the hallway. So when it was my turn, I get into the room. It's a big, beautiful room. And um, 
I was being interviewed by a white man who I didn't know at the time was this famous photographer Irving Penn. Now he introduced me to the editors of Italian Vogue and the designers, Basil, who um, was doing this advertisement for uh, Italian Vogue. And they were recruiting black models because he had an inspiration. He had, from my understanding, he had gone to Africa and got inspired by his summer collection. So with that, um, he asked me, did I have a picture or was I with an agency? And I told him, no, I wasn't with an agency. So he said, could, could he leave a picture? So I left a small Polaroid picture. He took a Polaroid picture of me, plus a picture that I had on me. And then um, two days later, his assistant called me and told me that I was booked for Italian Vogue, two days shoot, and each day I would get $1,500 for the day's work. So how did you feel uh, accomplishing, coming from where you came from to being on the front of Italian Vogue, how did that accomplishment make you feel? Well, I wasn't on the cover, but I well, was inside, inside, he was inside, in the pages. inside the pages. And I started out literally as an international model before I became an American model. So after t the two-day shoot, during that second day, Mr. Penn himself got on the phone, started calling around to agencies, and he wanted me to be handled personally and, and respectfully. So he found a small boutique agency called Zoli, Zoli Management, and they hired exotic looking women, um, African American women, Jamaican women, uh, Latin women, and the biggest model of that time was Pat Cleveland, and she was my sister agent with the agency. So with that, I went into the agency and um, got interviewed, signed right away, and the following week, they started sending me out on jobs. And so, so uh, overall, how many jobs did you go out on before you got to Claro? Um, I had did at least five, but they were mostly catalogs. I was flying down to Florida to do catalogs with them for iMagnum. Then I flew up to Chicago and did um, catalogs Jeez. up there. And then I flew out to Vegas and was doing catalogs in Vegas. I'm just like, it's just like just to sit and just hear your story and everything that you have been through. And it's just like, it just it hits a soft spot for me in my in, in my heart because it's just like it's just phenomenal that everything that you went through. So um, after flying from California to Chicago to Florida and stuff, when did you get involved with uh, Claro? Uh, my agency called and told me that I should be at this photographer studio, um, and. They just told me to have clean hair, clean face, and it turned out to be a test. So when I got there, the makeup artist applied the makeup, the hairdresser was there to, to do the hair. They sat me in front of uh, the camera, and they had a big boom light, much larger than this one, um, <laughs> to, to <laughs> sorry. <laughs> You know, no, but in photography, yeah. you need these super bright lights. So anyway, um, they set me down, and I was on this swivel chair, and so I just went back and forth on a swivel chair, you know, posing shoulders and doing like that, you know, on a swivel chair. And a week later, um, my agency called and told me I got a job with Clairol, and that I was to sign a two-year contract making X amount of money for the two years, and I have an option open for, depending on the sale of the box and the um, promotion, it was called Born Beautiful. And what Clara was doing was trying to reach out to the black community for, you know, for that money. <laughs> <laughs> for the money, for and, the advertisement, yes. to bring them all, to bring the black customers into the stores. Yes, yeah, so my color was Dark Old Burn, Box 512 and it was one of the most popular boxes of that entire summer and that entire year it turned out to be. So what they did after the two years use, they re-signed me for the third year, paid me, 
and I have another option for the for the fourth year for if it was to go. But by the time that happened, I had started working with Essence Magazine, and when I went up to Essence Magazine on my second shoot, that's when the, um, my truth was told, and my work literally stopped after that day. Uh. So I seen, I seen. I don't know if you uh, seen it, but I know, you, I know you probably did it. But I seen that they had uh, sat down and they interviewed uh, the lady that was behind the uh, shoot. Yes, Miss Susan Taylor. Yes, and she said that she didn't remember um, what had happened. She gave her a side of the story that she never called your agency and told them or things of that nature. How do you feel about, you know, because I'll I tell you, listen, let me tell you something, and I'm going to be honest. When, after I did my live, and then the girl sent me the, uh, the, about the interview, and you was back signed with them, everything Tracy Africa, I was on it, and listen, they, the camera, they were trying to find the camera people, everybody from that, from that, I don't read it all, honey, so, you know, I know the story, so, how do you feel, like, Hearing her side of the story, and do you think what she say? How do you feel about what she said? I have no comment. Okay, she has no comment. Okay. I mean, but she had she has her opinion, and maybe she didn't forget. Maybe she did forget some things, but um, I just leave it at that. Well, Tracy has no comment. I have a comment, baby. As beautiful and as stunning as Tracy is and everything in that era, it's no way that you would be able to forget this situation. This is something that will be embedded in you for the rest of your life. You will always think about that. And now that we're in the era that we're in now, it should be, it, it, I know it came back up with the way the transgender community, the way the LGTB is just out there. I know when everything came to the surface with us, I know she started thinking about it, but that's my opinion, so. Um, well, and, and <coughs> in the interview, she said that she didn't mention it, but it's quite possible maybe she didn't, I don't know. What I know is that I was on a set, I was in front of the camera, and I was taking these pictures, and the photographer had already gone through like two rolls of film. So, they were very excited of what I was doing. Now. When the client tells me, gives me a direction and tells me what they want from me, I have a tendency to have tunnel vision. So I only see what's in front of me. Everything on the side of me is all foggy. So what happened was I had started on the third roll of film and someone came in the door, which was to the left side of me, and they called the editor over to speak with her. And while they were talking, suddenly the left side of the room felt very negative. And my focus was broken in front of the camera. And what happened was is that the photographer noticed that I was losing concentration. So he asked me to rest. So when I did take a breath to, to breathe and to get my um, thought process together, uh, I just happened to glance over to that direction and saw Susan and um, one of the hairdressers that I had worked with at Essence prior to uh, speaking. So I felt something was up. I didn't quite know exactly what, but um, after that she closed the set down um, and everybody went home. I wish that we could, I wish that they could, because our day they said that nobody don't know where the pictures is at from that day, they don't remember. I wish that they could actually find those pictures so we could see what those pictures look like. And I also, when I was on my live, I said, I wish Claire Raw, since they had brought you back, I wish they would have did that uh, new box and had the old picture on the front and a new picture on the other side. And then you know have all of the you know the ingredients on the other side. That would have just been phenomenal because I would love to have that box just to have it as a keepsake of uh, value. So moving forward, um, I, I was watching the interview that the girl sent me, and they said you got a call in December 
of this year and of well last year and that you had a client wanted to meet with you and you went to the um, Pierre Hotel again? Uh, we did a uh, documentary at the Pierre Hotel okay. where they interviewed me and then um, took some photos up and down Madison Avenue and uh, we went to Central Park and did some photos and then we got caught in rain so I just went with it. <laughs> there was yeah, no, I see, I see there the was, video. There was no getting away from all of that water even under a tree so I just went with it and started um, enjoying the rain. So how did you, uh, when when you got the call and said that a client was a center, but before we even get to that, uh, were you working before you got the call doing things now since the community, everybody is loving us in the community and everything? No, what I, what I was doing at the time, um, I had had a job at a, shoe, a boutique shoe store in Soho and I was running that store and then we had a sister store on Madison Avenue and I would go up there sometimes too and then I was transferred up there. Now, during the recession when, you know, the World Trade Buildings went down, nobody was spending money. So eventually um, my boss had to close both stores. So it kind of fell in around the time where my grandparents who were in their 90s and I started taking care of them on my father's side, my grandparents. So I became um, their caregiver. Uh, for at least maybe two or three years before my grandmother died. My grandmother passed away, I believe, of a broken heart because my father had passed away of cancer and that was her only child. So she passed first. Then maybe six or seven months later, my grandfather passed. My grandmother was 92. My grandfather was 91. And so then I started uh, taking care of my mom because um, she got sick and it's gonna be alright take your time take your time it's gonna be alright I recently lost my mother on the 15th of January, 2015, um, I went to pick her up for dialysis. She was on dialysis. She never came down to the car, and I went upstairs and I discovered her body. And uh, it was something I wasn't ready. My mother truly loved me. She was my biggest cheerleader. Can we break for a minute?